start with uh, some motivation and uh, posture. <laughs> Oh, I'll just shut out the alien sounds, <laughs> this alien invasion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> I think uh, we all, we're all familiar with posture. Uh, I think, yeah, good, good. Make sure the uh, neck and shoulders are balanced and comfortable and the head Head, if it's tilted slightly forwards, downwards, that would be more comfortable. Uh, sometimes there's a tendency for the head to go up in the air, um, and then that puts pressure on the back of the neck. <clears throat> and uh, it's not very suitable at all. So let the head be uh, slightly inclined forward, downwards. So <clears throat> I think we're familiar with the meaning of the posture, but just for any uh, people who haven't heard this before, um, we sit in this way, uh, not only because it's an optimum way to, for the energy, uh, you could say the internal energies to flow smoothly within the body. It's good for the, uh, the uh, body-mind complex to sit like this for the physiology. The air can um, circulate much better in this kind of posture. But since we have an upright back and uh, the front of the body is open, that has tremendous significance. Uh, <clears throat> if we consider the, the vision, the aspiration that is encouraged and generated, in the Mahayana tradition, that vision, that aspiration is very vast. It um, encompasses countless beings, yeah, all beings that exist, actually. We're willing to uh, take the risk of at least aspiring to work for the benefit of all living beings. Uh, whereas up to now, if we're honest, if I'm honest, uh, one has only been working one has been working largely for oneself in a very self-centered way. That has been the natural uh, way of behaving. So if we're going to really go beyond you know, business as usual and to take that risk of reaching out uh, and being of some benefit, hopefully, to other beings, then... We need, uh, we need strength, we need uh, confidence, we need uh, discipline. And that is, uh, you could say, uh, that's represented by the upright posture. We're not going to sit in a twisted or bowed fashion. There is this upright, very confident posture because there's, you could say, there's a lot of work to be done. There's much to do. Uh, working with and for others. <clears throat> so we need tremendous confidence. The bodhisattva, the being that pledges to work towards Buddhahood for the sake of all, that being, that very noble being, uh, needs a tremendous amount of uh, self-confidence, courage, determination, and so forth to engage in that task. So that is represented by the way we sit. And the front of the body, of course, is open. Uh, and the front of the body uh, contains, of course, the, the, the soft organs, and it contains the heart. And uh, so therefore, the front of the body being open, it's not closed, it's not, uh, you know, being covered up. That represents our ability to, and our willingness to reach out and work with uh, beings, living beings. Mm. So the ideal, the bodhisattva ideal, the aspiration is to get rid of anything 
uh, that acts as a barrier uh, between oneself and others. And that is easy to say and very difficult perhaps to engage in because we have so many hang-ups and we are holding on tightly to ourselves, aren't we? To a sense of a self and a self-identity, uh, self-consciousness. It's hard also to break uh, the habits of the past. And as we said, the habit has been to naturally uh, take care primarily of oneself and often to disregard, neglect the, the, the welfare of other beings even those beings who are very close to us. Hmm. So as we sit like this, also let us generate a sense of being in the present moment and connect with the body on the cushion or chair. Just be aware of the sensation there. As you breathe in and out, naturally, and to pursue our motivation further, uh, here we are, still breathing, still living. Uh, we haven't died yet, although we know death is definite and could happen at any moment. We also, we know we have this precious human life, not just an ordinary life. We have a life where there is really an extraordinary opportunity to uh, investigate ourselves, work with the mind, subdue our mind, as Lord Buddha said, meaning to recognize and reduce the power of the afflictive emotions as much as we can. We have the power to generate love and compassion. We have that ability. We have the ability to investigate and understand how things exist beyond our hallucinated conception of how they exist. We can penetrate to the how things really are. So all of this we have right now, this opportunity. And when we look around, what do we see? We see beings engaged in incredibly painful experience engaged in uh, actions that are only going to create more and more confusion and pain for themselves and others. And this is so sad, so unbearably sad, because uh, why? Because we don't want suffering. We don't want unhappiness. And we keep on creating the causes for it through the actions of our body, speech, and mind. <laughs> So just as we would be sad if uh, a beloved family member or somebody, uh, a good friend was sick, ill, or engaged in actions that were harmful to themselves or others, how sad we would be, how much we would want to uh, help them, dissuade them from behaving in that way. Uh, when we look at the vast extent of human action, human suffering, you know, we really feel <clears throat> how wonderful, first of all, how wonderful if I could, if one could extend that feeling we have for our friend, our beloved ones, how wonderful if we could extend that feeling, that aspiration towards everybody as much as we can and not 
just limit our love and compassion to one or two people. <clears throat> How wonderful that would be. Because when we have uh, a very narrow or biased love and compassion, so-called, then there's uh, usually together with that, there is uh, a lot of uh, expectation, attachment. And then there is the uh, strong, there's the inevitability of disappointment, of pain, of suffering. So how wonderful if one could have a stable uh, sort of uh, mind of equanimity that saw everybody as very dear, very precious. Not feeling very close to some and uh, distant from other people. This is possible. This is possible to experience. It is said, because we can start with ourselves and see that we want to be happy and don't want to suffer. And that is the case for everybody. This is the thing that uh, unites everybody. Not wanting pain, wanting happiness, wanting pleasure, wanting pleasant sensations, situations. This unites everybody, whatever other differences there may be. We may be with somebody who, and we don't speak a word of their language, and they don't speak a word of ours, but we know that we share that. They don't want any unpleasant experience. They want happy experience, just like me. <clears throat> so on that basis, you see, we could extend that to everybody. Everybody, including the people at the moment that we, and as they say, we love to hate, the people we hear about, see on our media, and so forth. So spend some minutes, please, reflecting on the motivation, how not only do beings want to be happy, not only do they create the causes of suffering for themselves, the opposite of what they want, and in addition, of course, as we hinted, or <clears throat> we depend on them. We depend on beings for everything, including this very body. This is something to we can remember again and again. We depend on others for everything. <clears throat> How unbelievably well, kind they are. So please reflect on this from your own experience as well. <clears throat>
This is, of course, a vast uh, practice, a vast meditation. Uh, we are using it simply as a motivational exercise before the main body of our session. But yeah, this could be go gone into very, very deeply for a long time. There's one other thing regarding the motivation. And of course, it has a, a bearing on the whole, all of the topic the whole topic that we have, which is uh, how to awaken, uh, you know, love and compassion, uh, open our heart with love and compassion, even in very difficult uh, situations. Yeah. <clears throat> so when it at our center um, in Bodh Gaya, in the dining hall, I think, in the dining area, could be in one of the corridors. They they put up uh, nicely framed uh, quotations uh, from Lama Zopa uh late Lama Zopa Rinpoche, our uh, spiritual guide, uh, teacher. And uh, one of them is, um, and I think uh, we have it here at Tushita possibly. It says, think... Uh, Think or view the person in front of you as fulfilling all your wishes. Think of the person in front of you as fulfilling all your wishes. <clears throat> and this is a very profound statement. Uh, it doesn't mean this person is going to give you, you know, chocolate or, you know, give you some, uh, just some superficial um uh, sensory experience, you know. Uh, by this, Rinpoche means this person, our connection with this person, our attitude towards this person can either, of course, cause us to suffer if we generate, you know, anger and an unwholesome state of mind. But if we understand the preciousness of this person, just one person, and relate with that person in the right way, it, it, it can become the cause, one of the causes for complete complete enlightenment, complete awakening, you know. And that's whether this person is, uh, you know, being nice to us or not being nice to us. But if we are to awaken fully, we, we depend on all sentient beings. We can't leave out even one. So actually, from that perspective, it, it's, actually, it's actually better if this person in front of us is not behaving very well because then that will force us to work on our minds and to restrain uh, our wish to retaliate. It will make us reflect more on patience. It will make us reflect on suffering, and that will be very beneficial. If the person is being nice to us, then of course we can generate, easily generate gratitude, love and compassion towards that person as well. Yeah. And on that basis, we can generate more and more this wish to attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. So everything, you know, we can derive everything from the being in front of us in that sense, our attitude towards that person. They're fulfilling all our wishes. If we leave them out, if we neglect them, you see, if we say, I'm not going to help this person, I'm not going to love this person, here meaning, love meaning, I don't want them to be happy. I'm not going to work to make them happy in any way. I refuse to do that. I don't like them, etc., etc. Then uh, we are blocking the path to, to full awakening. And even blocking the, the path to happiness in this life. How can we be happy if we have closed our heart to, to, to certain people? and do not wish them to be happy, then, then there's a limitation there. There's a limitation. Mm. There's a lack of uh, total openness, uh, we could say. Mm. So then we will not have the full uh, 
spectrum of happiness and joy that we could have in this very life, well before we are an awakened person. <clears throat> yeah. So we can think as we sit here, or uh, you know, the people, the kind people online, uh, everybody here online and at Tushita, they're all. Uh, each one of them is helping to fulfill our wishes, each individual person's wishes, based on our way of looking at each and every one of the people here. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to engage in the rest of this session. Um, with 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 the motivation that uh, by looking at this topic based on our own experience and on the very deep teachings of uh, teachers and of uh, great beings of the past like Shanti Deva, uh, may we uh, generate a very very open, wise and loving heart towards everybody, and because of that uh, radiation of uh, love and compassion from us, may we therefore be of tremendous benefit for sentient beings who are confused and suffering and without any kind of guidance, proper guidance. May we really be helpful for them, care for them. Really, we could try to think and feel this uh, from the heart, not just uh, nice words. Okay. Yeah, so I was looking at uh, some teachings that uh, Lama Zopra Rinpoche um, gave during a uh, Avalokiteshwar retreat where they recite uh, millions of uh, Omane Pemehung mantras, the mantra of compassion. This is at uh, our institute in Australia in the year 2000. Um <clears throat> And of course, in the early part of the retreat, Rinpoche was talking a lot about how how beings are suffering. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, we must, I think, remember again and again. Uh, I met somebody today who, who said that they don't look at newspapers or the media now so much at all, and one could understand that. Uh, but, of course, we don't have to look at media and read the newspapers to understand suffering, to see suffering. But the point is, the point I'm making, we shouldn't cut ourselves off from the suffering of the world. Uh, one way or another, we need to be aware of how beings are torturing themselves and each other. And we can think of the famine, the wars, all the other problems that are happening, you know right now, <laughs> right now in this world. Yeah, and the tremendous uh, sense of mistrust, uh, hatred people have towards each other, even if they're not in a war with weapons. When we look at politics in the world, when we look at the polarization, it is just so sad. It is just so, so much suffering, so much uh, pain. 
created by that, you know. And in that way, people just create more and more and more difficulties. Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. Uh, let's start looking at Shantideva and then other things will fall into place. So we've been looking, of course, at uh, chapter six, the patience ch chapter. We started looking at that. <clears throat> And we paid some uh, quite a lot of uh, put quite a lot of emphasis on the verse which said, "Having found its fuel of mental unhappiness in the prevention of what I wish for, and in doing what I do not want, hatred increases and then destroys me." And we focused on um, the fuel of this enemy. The enemy is anger, and the fuel is mental unhappiness that comes from not getting what we want and getting what we don't want. So a difficulty, by, by definition, right, for us, a difficulty is something which is something uh, which we have generated resistance towards. We resist it, uh, whether it's the weather or the mosquitoes or, or somebody we don't like or what they're saying, whatever it is, uh, we generate resistance in our mind and aversion in our mind towards that which is a form of aggression which is is a form of anger you could say although it's not full-blown anger we develop aversion we develop a tremendous amount of maybe even low level uh mental unhappiness again and again we are developing that mental unhappiness you know um Recently, uh, you know, during a cup of, uh, well, uh, you know, a snack and a short uh, meeting with somebody in a, in a very nice uh, um, restaurant, one, there was a partition, there was a glass partition, and uh, the other side of the partition was a mother and a child, a uh, young son, maybe seven, eight years old. And <clears throat> opposite side of the table was presumably the father. Uh, he was on his mobile phone most of the time, or at least the times when I was uh, uh, you know, glancing at them. And the mother was sitting there looking most... Uh, I wouldn't say bored, but uh, unhappy, sitting there looking uh, unhappy and perhaps, you know, uh, some accumulation of resentment, you know, about this or that. And the child, and one would expect a young person, a child to be a little bit um, active and uh, have a sort of brightness about them, maybe, you know, moving a bit more, but this young child was just sitting there looking, uh, again, uh, bored and slightly unhappy. And one felt a lot for the, you know, the mother and the child. And also, of course, for the, you know, uh, for the man. Uh, I was coming to a restaurant, but uh, poor fellow had to, for one reason or another, he was talking on the phone. So he was not uh, enjoying uh, the restaurant or the company of uh, the woman and the child presumably it, it almost definitely was a family um, and then on the on my side of the partition uh, the person I was with was uh, actually quite uh, upset about the quality of the uh, dish that of of the food that was brought in front of them uh, there was a croissant actually Croissant, yeah, the French croissant. Uh, it was totally uh, not the way this person wanted. <laughs> totally not. Uh, you know, it was overcooked. It was probably old. 
uh, I asked them, how do you know it's old? Well, it's probably, you know, whatever. And it was overcooked. And and for sure, I also had a bite of it. And it, was, uh, it wasn't what I consider a croissant, you know. It was too dry and, uh, and yeah, it didn't even look right, you know. So that was returned. The uh, the uh, manager at one point, uh, was it the manager? Anyway, the waiter came and he had to take it back. Then the supervisor came. He had to, uh, you know, listen to a few words. And then they brought another one. That was also not right. So that went back as well, you see. So anyway, there's so many little causes of mental unhappiness in our life. You see, these difficulties are coming, you see. There's a difficulty in that croissant created in the mind. There's a resistance. And of course, why should one eat a croissant that is not, uh, you know, uh, perhaps properly, you know, cooked or presented or is too dry or too, you know, too roasted it is not correct. But it creates this tension in the mind. It creates some kind of mental unhappiness. It creates a resistance. And uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, waiter who had to take it back twice was also not, uh, you know, jumping with joy for that. So there's mental unhappiness happening next door here and presumably some other tables. But what we're saying is there's so many little things happening in life all the time, every day, every day almost of our lives, something is happening and is creating some resistance, creating some mental unhappiness. That becomes like a reservoir of uh, pain, if you like, although pain you might think is a strong word, a, a reservoir of resentment, a reservoir of dukkha, what the Buddha would say, dukkha, you know? or how we looked at it the other day, this um, crowdedness in the mind, the crowded mental elaborations in the mind, you know. Mm. And of course, I asked the person why why they felt it, it wasn't right, this croissant. Well, because they'd had croissants there before, and this was, uh, you know... It wasn't done right. So one was comparing it with good croissants that had been eaten before, and this one was defective. Result? Unhappiness, you know. Mental unhappiness. So th this builds up. And then somehow life becomes less pleasant, <laughs> less. We cannot trust situations, perhaps, that much anymore. We're always on the lookout for what is wrong, you know, what is not right in our estimation. So in that situation, we can see how it's going to be for many people and for most of us sometimes, uh, very difficult to maintain a wise and loving heart when there are difficult circumstances. <clears throat> because our perspective, our, our habit is to resist, is to come up against something which is not right, which we think is not right, which is unpleasant for me, and then there's that reaction. You know, there's very little spaciousness, you could say, in the mind. The mind has become a little tight, uptight, we say in English. Hmm. Again, there, there are many scenarios. Uh, I recently had to, again, uh, act as a kind of an arbitrator or peacemaker among some people I knew who were quarreling over, I thought, something a little, you know, quite petty in a sense. Uh, a pump had not been turned off in time, so water was uh, being wasted and of course it's not good to waste water but it led to harsh words you know a harshness of speech which created a very powerful reaction in another person and then it the whole thing escalated so it seems that to awaken a wise and loving heart in difficult circumstances we need to be aware of all of these seeds of aggression and anger in our mind and impatience in our mind. And we really need to be watching 
very carefully and actively also creating causes for happiness based on you know love compassion gratitude generosity all of those virtues that we read about hear about <clears throat> Is this making any sense? Does this make any sense? I mean, the topic is how to open our heart, to have a wise and loving heart. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the reason the water was overflowing, you see, at that time was that the person who usually turns it off was doing three or four tasks at once in a kitchen. So they And the door was closed because it was cold weather. And, and, you know, they couldn't hear the water, you know, overflowing on the roof and uh, so forth. Um, so, you know, they had a good reason. There was a good reason why they couldn't hear. But, you know, for the other person, it was almost like an insult that they hadn't turned off the pump. You know, and then they were, you know, since it had also happened once before. So one person got very angry, then the other person got very angry, and then it escalated, and uh, yeah. Then um, I had to practice patience by listening to both sides of the story. Uh, one person did it quite quickly, the other person took a long time to explain their side of the story. I didn't want to interrupt because I could see that uh, the person needed to tell the story, you know, and, you know, get it out of their system somehow. So anyway, uh, mental unhappiness, this is a huge, this is a huge reservoir of uh, pain and resentment that is built up. Um, <clears throat> because as Shantideva says, uh, it has no other function than that of causing me harm. It causes me harm, causes other people harm. And then he says something very Again, very pertinent in the next verse, verse 9, he says, Whatever happens to me, whatever happens, I shall not disturb my mental joy. For having been made unhappy, I shall not accomplish what I wish, and my good qualities will decline, my virtues will decline. So it's, it's very simple. You might say this is so simple, and it's like preaching, but... It is really something to take to heart. Whatever happens to me, how am I helping myself if I don't generate the qualities that are going to help me see that with equanimity, see it and not allow it to disturb my mental joy? Of course, you might say, uh, mental joy? What's that? I, I never have any mental joy. You know, My mind is always racing. My mind is always having problems. My mind is always busy. But here Shantideva seems to be saying to us that, look, we could, if we were skillful, we could have a lot more mental joy, mental peace, mental equanimity at least. But due to ignorance, due to habit, we just keep on reacting in the same way. You know? But, and he's also suggesting, isn't he? He's hinting that it is possible to maintain one's mental joy, whatever is happening. Whatever's happening, you know, I shall not disturb my mental joy. He's saying, I shall not disturb my mental joy. That's interesting, if that is correct. I don't know the Tibetan or the Sanskrit again. But that he he's not saying that person will not destroy my mental joy. He's saying, I will not disturb my mental joy. Meaning, the, it's it's my responsibility. It's up to me whether I react to this situation with aggression, with impatience, with, with whatever, or with equanimity or even love and compassion. It's up to me. It's up to this person. You know, I have to do the work. I have to change my projection, change my perspective on the situation. Yeah? Does that make sense? He doesn't say whatever befalls me, uh, the other person shall not disturb my mental joy. No, I shall not disturb my mental joy. Meaning, I am my best friend, I am my worst enemy, like it says in the Dhammapada, right? <clears throat> A well-directed mind is our best friend, and a mind that is uncontrolled is our worst enemy. So I'm going to make the effort to maintain 
my mental joy. I can do it by totally changing how I look at the situation. Hmm. Which is where that example of uh, the Chinese character for crisis is so interesting. So you could read that thing, you can see a situation as crisis, or you can immediately label it, you know, opportunity, opportunity. And remember something from the teachings even, like, you know, this person in front of me, uh, they are fulfilling all my wishes. So my resistance, my aggression towards what they are doing or saying is misplaced. It is not skillful. I need to try and change that because I could change it into an incredible situation, which will be most beneficial for me in my long-term peace and could even create strong uh, seeds, plant strong seeds for enlightenment. And at the same time, one could generate more and more compassion for the other person who is perhaps behaving badly by seeing how, as again, Shantideva with his incredible logic says, you know, because of me, this person is getting angry and creating the causes of hell because of me being around, you know. Me being in front of that person has caused him to, or her to behave badly, creating the causes for suffering. Me, knowing something of the you know mind training, I can use the situation to my advantage and uh, practice patience. And even not just patience, but love and compassion for that person. So, so I benefit so much. This poor person suffers, you know, is suffering. Even though I may not have done anything wrong, but because I'm in front of them, they've generated anger. I've been the trigger for their aggression, their anger, their sarcasm, whatever it is. So they're going to suffer due to that. They're creating a bad habit because of that. And what am I doing? I am creating the cause to be free, to be liberated. So again, the difficult person is somebody who's giving us an opportunity and we then have the opportunity to also, you know, develop tremendous concern for that person. Maybe not in that moment. It may not come right then, but later when we reflect how much that person was suffering, how much pain they had, you know, and that's why they behaved in that way, spoke in that way, you know. Hmm. So it always comes back, doesn't it, to compassion? Uh, and that quote is here on the board. As you come down the staircase, you see that. Um, <clears throat> that when problems come, experience them with compassion. Don't resist in our normal habitual way and get annoyed with them or angry with them. Um, it doesn't mean we can't be firm. And, you know, if obviously in a restaurant someone really put a dreadful dish in front of us and hasn't taken care to cook it or you know present it properly whatever we can we have the right of course we must say look this, this is not right you know this is not uh, prepared properly take it back but we can still do that with the overarching compassion why because <laughs> first of all we can see how it can make me unhappy so then i can feel compassion for myself if you like, but also it's like that person, <clears throat> the person who cooked that or prepared it due to carelessness is uh, has prepared a dish which is not suitable to be eaten. Why have they done that? What's the reason that it was prepared in that way? There must be a reason. Even if it's just sheer carelessness of that person, not caring perhaps, they're fed up or, you know, for some reason they don't like the job or they couldn't care less or they're jealous of people who can come in a restaurant and spend, you know, uh, 1,000 rupees on a snack. So maybe they just couldn't care less. But then you feel compassion for that person, right? For having that state of mind of not caring or being too tired, perhaps, not to prepare it properly, or being preoccupied with something that's happening in their life, which is distracting them. When they're supposed to be working, they're distracted by some problem they're having. Maybe it's a big problem. You know, we don't know. Lacking clairvoyance, we don't know. We just, maybe with tremendous annoyance, send the dish back. <clears throat> you know? 
and feel very justified in doing so. And which, of course, it's one of those situations where both both sides are right in a sense, or you could say none of the sides are wrong. Hmm. One way of looking at it. So <clears throat> this is where we can use wisdom as well, the wisdom of dependent arising, that things have causes. They're not, it's not a worldwide conspiracy against me, you know, when something turns up that I don't like. It has causes and conditions. The causes of happiness sometimes occur, but the causes for suffering are very frequent. <laughs> Without suffering, there's no renunciation. Therefore, O oh mind, you should stay firm, stand firm. So if we are serious about generating the path, we do need some detachment. We do need renunciation. We do need to renounce uh, to a great degree, don't we? The eight worldly feelings. So for that reason, suffering is good. It reminds us that a life lived preoccupied with the eight worldly feelings is going to bring suffering. And things that happen to us due to karma, maybe you know, past accumulated karma, that is also a suffering situation. So then we begin to look at how samsara, which is a whole litany of bad habits created you know, through repeated unwholesome karmic action is something which is tremendously of a suffering nature. So then we develop renunciation of that. We get sick and tired of it. How would we get sick and tired of samsara if, if there were no suffering situations? So we need suffering. We need suffering to generate uh, renunciation. Of course, suffering is not enough. We also need compassion. We need wisdom. It's not enough to go around just suffering. But we're saying it can generate that spirit of renunciation <clears throat> where we see the futility of uh, the way we live. Uh, a life of birth, sickness, aging, death, and in between uh, meaningless sort of uh, pursuits without much meaning, which have no lasting value, uh, without anything valuable internally that we can take with us when we die you know so when we go in a big mall or something and then we see all these shops with the glitter uh, then we wonder one might wonder uh, what amongst all these things that I can see even if it's a wonderful bookshop which of course is a great allure for someone like me but you know what what can we take with us you know what are we going to take with us when we die i mean <clears throat> we're only going to take uh, our uh, sanskars our imprints with us imprints of action hmm. so renunciation is good isn't it it's something more uh, necessary but how would it happen without pain, without dukkha, without suffering? But the other thing that Shantideva, who is nothing if not practical, in verse 14 he says, there's nothing whatsoever that is not made easier through acquaintance. Meaning everything becomes easier when we become used to it. So we can become used to difficult situations. You know, if we have the right attitude, we can become used to it. It's not going to destroy us. It's not going to make us, you know, depressed every time it happens. So through becoming acquainted with small harms, I should learn to patiently accept greater harms. So gradually begin to uh, build up our inner strength by dealing with uh, tricky situations. And then we'll be able to, you know, patiently accept greater harms. You know? Uh, that uh, story of the person that I gave 
quite recently, I think. The father who lost uh, two children, at least two children, in a bombing raid. or And uh, he decided he was not going to generate hatred towards the people who had uh, killed his children, but rather use that situation to develop an organization that helped people who were in war situations. And he didn't develop anger and resentment or any kind of desire for revenge against the people uh, who had done this, who had done that. So it is possible, even without being a card-carrying Buddhist, to, to generate these very noble qualities, seeing the futility of aggression and anger in response to harm. And there are those very rousing words, very inspiring words from that early text, yeah, the Dhammapada, uh, which is uh, a classic, of course, of the Theravadan tradition, where <clears throat> it is very simply stated that, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> hatred is not uh, overcome by hatred. Yeah, uh, Hatred is overcome by love. Uh, this is an inter an in eternal truth. Yeah, hatred is not overcome by hatred. Hatred is overcome by love. This is an eternal truth. So, so, <clears throat> so we need to generate that enthusiasm for understanding, trying to develop that mind of love, having appreciation for a mind of kindness and love, and um, giving up. Uh, being addicted to the kind of resistance in the mind that leads to aggression and anger and irritation, since they just totally destroy what we're actually looking for, which is happiness. So I shouldn't be impatient with heat and cold, wind and rain, sickness, bondage, beatings, for if I am, the harm they cause me will only increase. Mm. <clears throat> then he says, uh, when wise people, when people who are not just, we spoke of uninstructed worldlings, yeah, but when even us uninstructed worldlings uh, generate some degree of wisdom through study, reflection, perhaps some meditation, then we might be the kind of person that Shantideva talk, is talking about in verse 19, where he says, even when the wise are suffering, their minds remain very clear, very lucid, and untainted, undefiled. For when a war is being waged against the disturbing conceptions, much harm is caused at the time of battle, meaning we should expect there to be some fireworks. Yeah? We're not working in a situation that is easy. We're working with a mind which is full of disturbing conceptions. So we should expect there to be a battle, a kind of a battle. Is going to happen some kind of uh, resist uh, some kind of uh, facing with and dealing with these emotions these uh, disturbing emotions is going to happen but the wise person still stays very clear you know very lucid doesn't allow their mind to become uh, tainted by uh, tremendous aggression because what we see in our minds and in the world is tremendous aggression at the smallest thing, people get so aggressive, right? It's the same aggression that causes wars. So the victorious warriors are those who, having disregarded all suffering, vanquish, destroy the enemies of hatred and so forth. Those are the real warriors, he's saying. Common warriors are killing slay-only corpses, meaning you're, if you kill someone, 
uh, as a soldier or an ord ordinary warrior, you're killing someone who's going to die anyway. So <clears throat> that's no big deal, killing people, apart from being negative karma. The real warrior destroys hatred and so forth. Then a very important, very important verse, goodness me, uh, verse 21, suffering has good qualities. So which if, you know, suffering, uh, stroke difficulties, yeah, have good qualities. What are they? Through being disheartened with these difficulties, with suffering, one's arrogance can become less. Our arrogance is dispelled, yeah? We become more mellow. We become softened by that, that suffering. Compassion arises for those in cyclic existence, obviously. Compassion, that's the definition of it. Without any suffering, there is no compassion. So we feel compassion, the wish to free others from their suffering. Negativity is given up because we ask what are the causes of suffering and the causes of suffering are unwholesomeness, unwholesome karma, yeah, based, uh, you know, the 10 unwholesome actions and actions based on uh, ignorance, anger, attachment, and so forth. So we, we begin to understand that and give up unwholesome actions. And we find joy practicing virtue. We really feel happy when we can practice virtue. Whether it's virtue in the sense of uh, uh, practicing the discipline, you know, moral conduct, concentration, wisdom, if we are aiming for nirvana, and then adding, of course, the great compassion, bodhicitta, uh, on the Mahayana path. So, you know, um, we find joy practicing and developing these qualities, practicing the six perfections of the Bodhisattva. There's great joy in doing that. Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Then, uh, this is very important. What, uh, you know, that first, that arrogance is dispelled, compassion arises, negativity is given up, joy is found in virtue. Thanks to suffering. If we're just having a good time, if the... Uh, croissants were always perfect and the coffee and tea were always perfect, then we would become so sloppy and uh, probably overweight and kind of just sit in cafes all day, you know. But because there is suffering, we can develop these qualities. So, then Shantideva introduces more of the wisdom side of the situation, how we can uh, dispel our resistance, our anger, our discomfort at difficult situations through, through the wisdom side of the teachings. So he says, as I do not become angry with great sources of suffering, say, such as jaundice, why be angry with animate creatures, you know, with humans, animals? Why? Because they too are provoked by conditions. They are, we are all the slave of conditions. Although they are not wished for, these sicknesses arise. Likewise, though they are not wished for, disturbing conceptions forcibly arise. Without thinking to themselves, I shall be angry, people become angry with no resistance. And without thinking, I shall produce myself, anger itself is produced. All mistakes that occur, all mistakes that occur, and all the various kinds of wrongdoing arise through the force of conditions. They do not govern themselves. You see what he's saying? That everything as a cause is, is a result of conditions. These conditions that assemble together have no intention to produce anything, neither does their product have the intention to be produced. Here he gets very philosophical, but what he's saying is everything is governed by other factors. 
which in turn are governed by others. You know, the fact that your croissant may be cooked wrong, it, it, it has causes. And if we were to know all the causes, it might actually make us feel very, very sorry and compassionate for the cook, you know. Um, anyway, everything has a cause. Having understood this, I should not become angry with phenomena which are like apparitions. So they have causes, and these causes are changing all the time. So that the person in front of you can uh, be like a, sh a chameleon that can change their color, their mental state within moments, within seconds. <laughs> Don't know if any of you have had this experience. It can be quite, uh, sometimes quite entertaining, sometimes quite disturbing how quickly others and, of course, our own minds can change due to various triggers, various situations, various conditions. So when one sees an enemy or even a friend committing an improper action by thinking that such things arise from conditions, I shall remain in a happy frame of mind. So one realizes, you see, things are caused by, if they're caused by conditions, it means that actually they can also be changed by changing the conditions or getting rid of certain factors. We can then create a better situation. So there's no need to be angry, no need to be depressed. Everything depends on something else. So if I put the right ingredients into play, then things can change. Because you see, he, then Shantideva says, if things were brought into being by choice, then since nobody wishes to suffer, suffering wouldn't occur to any embodied creature. So why does suffering occur? Conditions. Many kinds of conditions, causes conditions, habitual patterns, based, rooted, of course, in the ignorance. <clears throat> Through not being careful, people even harm themselves with thorns and other things. They become obsessed and deprive themselves of food. So even if I can't develop compassion for such people, the last thing I should do is to become angry with them. So okay, even if I can't develop compassion for people, who through the arisal of disturbing conceptions set out to even try and kill me and so forth, the last thing I do, should do, Shantideva says, is to become angry with them. Even if it were the nature of the childish to cause harm to other beings, it would still be incorrect to be angry with them, for this would be like begrudging fire for having the nature to burn. So maybe we can have some discussion. We've been talking for a long time. <clears throat> Remembering the theme. Maybe people have some examples, some experience they want to share of disturbing uh, experiences or difficulties, which um, actually, when looked at in another way, became causes for uh, some benefit, some some benefit to arise, something right. positive came out of it. <clears throat> it's distinctly pleasurable, as you know. I have often bored you and others here. Have you? Okay. I have a long uh, property. Uh, yeah, property uh, battle, yes. Anyway, that got over. It had to get over. The judge said, please come to your senses. And we did, and it got over. Then uh, I was quite bitter and angry and all that. But my brother's two children were involved, who in fact inherited the bulk of the property. Mm. This is when I eventually took a legal share, which was very little. Two things happened. Uh, the girl, because of family condition, sensitivity, oversensitivity, and talked to something. Some people have 
a more of a tendency to suffer and absorb and react. Some of us are more thick skinned, perhaps. She became a very disturbed and violent person. So, for the past seven years, with the help of her servant, we have been quietly giving her a very simple, mild homeopathic medicine called batch flower remedies. You may have heard of them. Batch flower. Uh, release stress. And uh, I'm happy to say she's almost normal. So hmm. I had the opportunity of uh, saying, okay, this is my brother and his mean wife. But here are two, two children who were in the family who suffered. The elders started fighting and he was being, you know, and he created. So uh, I said, so I was able to uh, detach myself from my brother and his wife and look at his children in a different way as the children, a grandchildren of, of my parents. And I helped the girl. Then in the last uh, two years, three years, the builder who was rebuilding the house misbehaved. And for the last uh, six months, he wasn't finishing it. I didn't tell my nephew who was again ready to take him to court. I said, calm down, I'll handle it, I'm here. And uh, perhaps I should or should not have done it, but to hasten it, put in a little money of my own into one or two things and helped certain parts of it be completed. And I chased the builder, I calmed the tenant, I got the flat completed on the 27th. This is one reason I stopped coming. I've been very busy. On the 27th of December, uh, almost impossibly, the soil flat on top got ready. And a few days ago, I handed it over to the tenant with apologies. Hmm. So, uh, so Ritaji, are you going to tell us how you transformed the situation? I transformed with... the situation because everybody said, why are you bothered about them? They are your enemies. Mm. And I said, no, they are my flesh and blood. They are my next generation and I have to help them. Mm. Because uh, I dealt with a nasty builder. I'm experienced and I know it's always going to stop them. Mm. So uh, I'm uh, today as a family, we are together again and that bitterness is over. Mm. And I feel I've been able to improve my karma by helping these two kids. What changed in your mind that that uh, the situation got better? I think uh, compassion grew stronger than anger and bitterness. Mm. I don't know why it happened. Mm. Mm. And I just thought here are two children. They have no grandparents. Their parents are dead. Mm. And on the mother's side, there's no real, nobody, nobody really. My sister's abroad. Mm -hmm. There's only this old aunt, a battle axe, who can deal with the situation. The boy is in Ireland. He's not even in India. Mm -hmm. The girl is disturbed. How is this situation to be resolved? So mm -hmm. actually, there was nobody else but me to do it. So I said, it's also a question of your moral responsibility. It's not their situation only. It's also you can do it, and so you should. And I did do it. Mm. God, I, the divine forces were with me, mm. and I was able to. This would have again been a terrible karmic situation for my nephew and me. Mm. If the builder too had sort of stabbed them. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sri. That's that's good. Uh, what helped you? Years of Buddhist practice. Buddhist practice. Mm -hmm. I think it, <clears throat> these very thoughts and ideas. Somewhere they made an impact. Okay. And the normal human reaction of it to see it and serve them right got overtaken by compassion. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. I think. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, people online won't have heard all of that. And... Um, but basically a, a, a quite a disturbing situation that had been going on for someone for a long time. Uh, it changed partly, I think, because um, there was an attitude towards it 
uh, towards the people, uh, which came more from an understanding of their situation and their difficulties and their pain. And so for more from a place of uh, compassion rather than just um, annoyance and the wish to struggle with them. Uh, so that in the end seemed to, and years, uh, Rita Ji is saying of um, also uh, exposure to Buddhist teachings may have helped to see the situation in a different way and to uh, you know generate more positive states of mind uh, which helped the situation in the end. So like that. Um, um, looking at the chat, Anushri has asked a question uh, after a long time and I can't see, oh, there she is, yeah. Is that the question you want to ask? Can you please read and explain the next two lines also after, I will not disturb my mental joy. Hmm. Yeah, I shall not disturb. Uh, the next two lines are, for having been made unhappy, I shall not accomplish what I wish, and my virtues will decline. Uh, what's difficult about that? Uh, is, isn't that, is that difficult? For having been made unhappy, I shall not accomplish what I wish, and my virtues will decline. Of course, there's an unhappiness, which is a kind of, uh, uh, the unhappiness or sadness that comes, that can create renunciation. Of course, that's another kind of, um, of uh, unhappiness with samsara. But here, Shantideva doesn't mean, I think, that kind of unhappiness that leads to renunciation. Here, he's saying that if you're unhappy, meaning resentful, and you become bitter because of your suffering, then, or, or something like envy, then you won't accomplish what you wish for. I mean, you wish for happiness, you wish for success. Lama Zoprimpache used to tell the children at our school in Bodhgad that, you know, and tell us that, jealousy and envy uh, actually create the cause for lack of success. Rejoicing creates the cause for success. Envy is, uh, is, doesn't create that cause. It creates a cause for failure. So this unhappy mind, full of mental unhappiness, it's always create, it is engaging in actions which um, ensure that we won't get what we really want, which is happiness and peace, you know. We may get some minor, you know, we might even get a job that we want, but we won't get happiness and peace in our life. And more often than not, we won't even get these mundane things because who wants to give a job to, you know, you go to the in, you go to the interview, you know, and your face looks like you want to, you know, strangle someone or burst into tears. It's 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 not a good, uh, you know, sign to give the interview, you know. If you go in there and you start moaning about something or complaining or, and saying, you know, this room is badly decorated or, you know, could you give me a more comfortable chair to sit on or whatever, uh, you won't accomplish what you want. So, and obviously one's good qualities will decline. If we're really unhappy uh, or if we have depression and despair, uh, how does that help our good qualities? <clears throat> yeah. Does that make sense, Anushri? Anushri, yeah, you, yes. Anything still not uh, understandable there? No, we muted them. Kabir. I've unmuted. Yeah. Oh, I've muted again. How do I just stay unmuting them? Yeah, you can talk now, Anushri. Yeah, what's yeah. Hi, Kabirji. Hi. Can you hear what's me? Un... Yes. What's unclear now? Anything? No, no, I have another question of the oh. like, of another text. Like, yeah. So, oh. the, like the next thing, yeah, which you read. Two for the price of one. Okay. <laughs> Hit us with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we are all, like you said, you talked about how everything is a result of conditions and uh, everything has a cause, right? And uh, causes are changing all the time. And then we should not be disheartened because if they are changing, then we can also 
the situations yeah. will change if we change the causes right conditions yeah. so th- yeah. and then you at one point you said that things are brought about by conditions and not by choice but then Ashanti the choices was said, are, yeah yes yes that's right and then so i didn't understand that conditions are created by choices are we are making choices all the time no what he said was that um why is that verse the verse with the choice in it he's saying that uh, if things were in our own hands uh, up to our own choice you know nobody wants to suffer so suffering wouldn't occur if it was up to our choice we would say i don't want to suffer and suffer suffering would not happen you know but it's not like that why because there are so many conditions causes and conditions that are not under our control right now and we are also at the mercy of karmic uh, cause and effect you know which we have to um, you know we have the particular body and so many other factors in our life due to karma due to those conditions you know due to those causes of course as we become more spiritually evolved and more courageous and more skillful and wise and loving and so forth we start creating more and more conditions for happiness and so forth but right now we are uh, in our present state we are much more you could say the slave of conditions that's easy to understand i think the more unevolved one is the more one is the slave of various conditions we have no means to deal with them you know for example if we're in a suffer- if if people annoy us if we go to a place where people are uh, you know talking loudly we may quickly get annoyed uh, so we can say the conditions are disturbing us once we begin to work with our mind and generate patience through practice then it it's not such a big deal so we've already you know kind of uh, neutralized those kind of conditions we prevented them from creating further suffering in our life uh, so i don't think there's any problem there you have to understand read mm. the uh, text and the context and uh, it'll become clear i think yeah and also like <clears throat> i was wondering if or like this be grudging fire for having the nature to burn that passage can you send me a pic of that like later on like whenever you have time or you don't have you, the la- you haven't taken shanti deva for- you haven't taken shanti deva to rishi valley school with you you should have uh, yeah. shanti deva in rishi valley school yeah <clears throat> We grudging fire for having the nature to burn. I didn't understand. I I couldn't write it down. Again, that's easy to understand. Say someone goes in the kitchen and gets angry with fire for burning, you know, for being hot. You'd say that was a very foolish person, you know, because there's also the person who says my soup is cold, you know. So you want hot soup, but you're begrudging fire for being hot and burning. that's ridiculous you know that's the sign of a very foolish person so uh he's saying there are certain people who because of causes and conditions they are like that right now they are childish they are harming you you know that's their nature right now mm. you know <clears throat> he's saying rather he's saying if it is even if you see it's not the nature of people to be like that forever they are not like fire people are not like fire because they can change fire can't change but shanti dev was saying even if they were like fire that you know a certain person was inherently difficult or or, or harmful and aggressive there's there's no need to be angry with them because it would be the same as being angry with fire for you know being you know being what it is which is hot and burning or for being angry with mosquitoes for you know buzzing and biting you know that's just what they are that's what they do so like that but i can definitely send you uh, a picture of that if you want but you really must get a copy of shanti deva it's not enough to be in uh, krishna murti school you must have this great buddhist Kavishri text and also thing hmm. yeah and this uh, you're having four four it. questions now you understand you're having four questions this is the last one and then we'll have some yeah yeah. yeah yeah no no i just wanted to ask that uh, this uh, thing passage the whole paragraph about condition ah uh, bolo yeah what 
yeah the passage about conditions and choice hmm. and all that is also hmm. that uh, also you read out from shanti deva's text also only or some other book that's all from shanti deva's chapter 6 yeah all from and and of course this is online uh, anushri there's no need for me to spend the uh, whatsapp time sending you a picture if you look at the s- chapter 6 on patience you could have a thorough read of the first uh, 40 verses and uh, then that will be very useful um, okay thank you yeah yeah. yeah it's it's online it's definitely a pdf is there online you don't need to pay for it and you can uh, download it and uh, okay. that's one on choice that is verse 34 verse 34 thank you thank you yeah, thank you great okay. anybody else from tushita yes generous and they want more biscuits Uh, my patience will run out when it gets very close to the end of the biscuit box you know or if i really think it's not a big deal they can have all the biscuits they want but yeah how much who is that person do you have influence over them you know how much can you help them uh, what is what do they actually want from you is it something which you could easily give more of or is it something that you can't is it something that's going to harm them or make them more greedy are they simply uh, just um so somebody who's very needy and who uh, you know uh, regards you as somebody whom they can um, yeah whose time they can take up for example you have to decide in the background one would say in the background meaning in the back of one's mind or not even the back of one's mind in one's heart there is always that sense of affection and kindness for beings right that's the essence of mahayana okay and even buddhism as a as a whole one might say there's that kindness loving kindness towards beings so you realize okay here's a being who's as going through birth sickness old age death all of the other sufferings all the levels of suffering and here they are they are behaving in this way which seems to me first you have to check maybe they're not asking too much from you maybe we are just uh, selfish and miserly you know i usually give you know we might say i usually give my guests a cup of tea and two biscuits why does this person want four biscuits why are they asking for more that could be my problem not their problem you know if i'm miserly with what i have but some people as we know might you know very greedily want 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 and uh, you know take a lot of your money uh, you know out of their their habit to you know take and not think about your situation or the, or they might take up a lot of your time when they know when you know that they know that you don't have much time but uh, they will take up a lot of your time you know whereas they know that you have things to do but they'll still want to take up your time with 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 with, with very minor things so then you have to we have to put a limit this is a very difficult one this this i have big challenge for me this one I'm slowly learning how to be quite firm with certain people and say look i don't have time now i have other things to do you know um it's not easy and again it depends who it is if it's a mother or father you know that you're looking after or or something then again we have to compassionately do what we do <clears throat> and remember always the key advice which is there in many places including the eight verses of training the mind that when we see a disturbing emotion arising we str- recognize and avert it you know before it hmm. uh, does that make sense it's not easy and it would depend situation to situation wouldn't it 
who the person is, you know, is it your child? Is it your husband? Is it your mother, father? Is it your boss? Is it a co-worker? Is it, is it a beggar in the street? You gave 10 rupees and they look at you sullenly, you know, because you've come out of a mall or something. Uh, you know, you should be giving me a lot more, you know. <laughs> you just spent thousands in the mall and you're giving me 10 rupees. Come on, you know. And then you may, you know, then, then later one might think, wow, you know, that person, yeah, there's some logic to what they're saying, you know. <clears throat> they're not sitting outside a, a DOS house or a place where poor people sleep. They're, they're begging in the right place, you know, outside a mall. Uh yeah, anyway, it, it depends on the situation very much. Uh, yeah. How do you apply equanimity, equalize yourself and the other here to me? How? This kind of, yeah. Well, yeah. you tell us. I'm sure, I'm sure you can. How would you do it? I think it's also about our reading of ourselves in terms of what, where do we stand in terms of whom do you usually prioritize? If you think uh, you are a, a, a person who, you have a mind who who easily gives and do not keep uh, any time for oneself, then one needs to be able to start getting a skill of uh, uh, protecting yourself as well and vice versa. Yes. But uh, what are the skills which is needed to make those lines become very difficult? Mm. Well, after a while, one realizes one is getting exhausted and is not helping anybody by not drawing boundaries. And uh, so then, you know, the other person is using you or, or whatever, or, or or oneself can never say no to people. Then one is uh, causing harm to oneself. That's not compassion, to cause harm to oneself, um, especially in situations where it's clear that other people are actually taking advantage of you and of your nature. So... Um, yeah, we have to we have to draw boundaries, um, relative boundaries. I mean, in one sense, there's no boundary. In one sense, because okay, you're you're a sentient being. I'm a sentient being. I want you to be happy. I want you to be free of suffering. In, in that sense, we transcend a boundary. We all want to be happy, but then in this specific situation, we have to have a boundary. Uh, just to protect our own minds and our own bodies and to protect the other person from uh, developing more and more neediness or more and more greed or more and more um, rather deceitful even state of mind where they're just taking advantage of us. So, uh, But it's often very difficult to know what's going on. Again, if we're not clairvoyant, we don't really know sometimes what the other person's motivation is. And this I can see a lot in uh, aggression between people and difficult situations. People mishear often what other people are saying because we have a particular view of what they must be saying, you know. We think we know what they must be saying and we actually don't get it. Or a certain tone of voice is taken one way by, you know, different ways by different people. It all depends on what is happening in our own mind, which is why Shanti Deva is saying that uh, you know I am responsible. I I am not going to. I must, you know, not add to the fuel of my own mental unhappiness. Yeah. It was very interesting that he uses the first person, you know, participle. I am responsible for not. I am responsible to not allow the escalation to happen. You know, can't keep on just blaming the other person, uh, etc. I have to do the work. <clears throat> We've got to stop there. Sorry, there's a limit. There's a boundary to this as well. <laughs> I'm setting boundaries now. It's not like the COVID times when we'd go on till 8.30 and I'd be yawning away right throughout it. Um, so now we're back in sort of more normal times. Uh, so anyway, I'm very grateful to all of you. We'll continue this on Thursday. Um but, uh, Alas, I will be coming back to Delhi again and again because I have property and cousin and aunt and all these things. Huh? I will come back secretly and leave secretly most of the time, but sometimes they will announce it if I'm going to be teaching at the center. No, but he, he may, may. You not announce.
basically my message is everyone should come to Bodh Gaya and get enlightened yeah. and under oh, the Bodhi yeah. tree. Don't stay in Delhi. It's taking 11 years off your life, according to the statistics. Will you come to Delhi? Will you be giving talks? It depends on my uh, whether I'm in, on good terms with the uh, Delhi establishment or not. Whether the tea given is in a proper cup like this or in an ordinary cup, it depends, you know, on how much they pay me, you know, all these things. Uh, but yeah, I hope uh, to come again and again. Why are you walking towards me? This is, oh goodness, Anna. Very small, New Year. Well, well, this. Thank you, Will. For Tushita, thank you so much. Very kind of you, Ritaji. Rita also donated this carpet that she's walking on right now. Hmm? It's very nice. No, not still. It will continue. Very nice. It's a very nice carpet. So we're very grateful to you. So look, we're grateful to everyone, aren't we, all the time for being there and uh, helping us, disturbing us, whatever they're doing, whether they are a mosquito or a sponsor, all these kind uh, mother sentient beings. We uh, dedicate that we may be beneficial for them, help them, be a guide for everyone, not harm them at least. May all our teachers have long and healthy lives. May all their wishes be fulfilled. May we never be separated from uh, holy dharma, authentic holy dharma, life to life. Yeah, May we always uh, appreciate that and always pray for the longevity of the teachings, for them to stay a long time in this world to help others. Uh, may there always be teachers who can understand and uh, teach there and guide us uh, on the basis of these teachings, explain the teachings on the basis of their authentic experience, which is why we need the highly realized masters uh, to live for a very long time. Yeah. <clears throat> so she may his holiness the Dalai Lama have long and healthy life, all his wishes be fulfilled. Then we also uh, dedicate for the quick, uh, swift return of uh, Yabji Lama Zoprimpache, who passed away last April. May uh, there be the quick, as His Holiness wrote, the, the smile of the new incarnation. And uh, may we relate to that, uh, um, you know, to the swift, uh, to the unmistaken reincarnation uh, wisely and uh, benefit uh, from their presence in this world through correct uh, guru devotion. Yeah. Uh, may Tushita be more and more beneficial for sentient beings um, through uh, fulfilling uh, Lama Zoprimpache's wishes. All the personnel that may be needed for the center in the future, may they all, um, mm, may all the, those posts and so forth, all of the personnel that needed be found <clears throat> so that Tushita can flourish uh, more and more in the future. May beings think of benefiting one another. May war, famine, and disease uh, be lessened and end. May we develop a healthy relationship with our home, this planet, and stop uh, exploiting in the way we are now, leading to <clears throat> unbelievable calamities for everybody. Uh, may we uh, always uh, bow down before our spiritual masters uh, through whose kindness we develop. Which not just, of course, the outer, but the inner guru. May we fully activate the inner guru, uh, the Buddha nature. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody online, and um, thank you, 